a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked these things. And then God goes on to say, because you haven't asked for long life, or riches, or so forth. He says, I'll give you those things, too. But Solomon became the wisest man of his generation. We still speak of the wisdom of Solomon. It's proverbial. Because God was testing Solomon as to what choice he would make. Sometimes we are tested in regard to our choices. What do we choose? Every one of us has to make a lot of choices every day. Some of those choices seem very minor, and they probably are. But some of them have more eternal consequences. Where we will go, what we will do, what friends we'll go with or not go with. I'm using a good old North expression, go with. But where, what are we going to do? What choice are we going to make? Are we going to go to this place of amusement or that place? Are we going to put that in our mouth or not? This thing or that thing? And take it into our bodies? Those are all choices we have to make. Some of you perhaps have been to the beautiful Glacier National Park. In Glacier National Park in Montana, there is a high mountain called Triple Divide Peak. Triple Divide Peak. The rain or snow that falls on that mountain, depending on where it falls, ends up far, far away from where it would have fallen if just a few inches to the other side. The rain and snow that falls on one side goes out to the Pacific Ocean. The rain and snow that falls on another side goes out down into the north and east to the Atlantic Ocean, all the way out to the northeast to the Atlantic Ocean. And the snow and rain that fall on the other side, the third side, go down the Missouri River and out through the Mississippi and out into the Gulf, just from that one mountain. And it could only be a few inches different where that falls. And yet, in the end, the water is thousands of miles apart. I submit that this is a very apt illustration of how our very slight choices sometimes may have very great consequences in where we end up later on, both in this life and in the life to come. Those daily choices are testings my friends and brethren and sisters. And what choice you make may very well have a very important result in your life later on. You need to think about those choices. Those choices are testings. And you have to decide what you're going to choose. Joshua said to the generation of his day, Choose you this day whom you shall serve. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a choice that we've been offering this week to each of you, especially perhaps to those who have never yet made that choice, who have never yet said to the Lord, I will choose you, I will follow you, you will be my teacher. I'd like to look at just one more. In John 6, from the life of our Savior. <clears throat> John 6, verse 5. Or it was started in verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And then Jesus went on to feed the 5,000. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to change the bread and 
fish, the few loaves of bread and the few fish that were there into multitudes to feed the 5,000. But he proposed to Philip a hard task. He said, what are we going to do, Philip? Here are all these people. And it says he said this to him to prove him. I think the Lord has given us some hard tasks. He is telling us to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. He's telling us to stand up in our community before our friends and say, this is what I believe, and this is the way I live, and this is what I understand, and this is what I stand for. There's an old saying that those who will not stand for something will fall for anything. Where do we stand? Do we stand with Jesus and his disciples and his apostles? He has given us some hard tasks, but at the same time he said, Lo, I am with you always, or literally every day, all the days, even until the consummation of the age. King James says, end of the world. Christ is with us. He's promised to be with us if we do the tasks that he has given us to do. And in that very place where he said, Lo, I am with you always, he's telling the disciples to go out and preach in all the world. The Great Commission. Yes, we have some tests that we're going to face. He's going to give us some tests, perhaps like he gave Abraham. Perhaps tests like he gave Solomon. Tests like he gave Philip. We have all of these possibilities in our lives. God is indeed testing us day by day. But we have to decide whether or not we want to pass the tests. There's coming, as every school has, a graduation day someday. God's graduation day is to enter his kingdom with immortality. Someday, someday Christ is coming back to grant eternal life to those who are ready, to those who have passed the test, to those to whom he can say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will give thee authority over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Do you look at yourself as one who is in God's school and Christ is your teacher and his word is here to instruct us and the ones he has sent, the ministers and the teachers of the word as helpers in that work, in that school? That's what we all are. None of us really are teachers in the sense that Jesus or the apostles are at most we're teachers aides. That's what we're doing. We're trying to aid. We're trying to help. Put to the test. You will be put to the test. Let me assure you of that. I will be put to the test. We are being put to the test every day whether we recognize it or not. It is up to us to pass the test by yielding our lives to the Lord by accepting the teachings of his word, living by them, learning those lessons, and going forward with him to the new lessons which are ahead in his service. I pray that he will help each one of us to learn and to walk and to succeed in his school. That's my earnest prayer for each one of you. his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image 
became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Of course, this is what Nebuchadnezzar had seen. Nebuchadnezzar offered no objection to this description. It's obviously what he had visualized in his dream. It was the image of a great man standing there, head, arms, chest, belly, legs, feet, all the parts of a man standing there, frighteningly, probably gigantically, although we're not told that. And then the strange picture of a stone cut out from a mountainside, uh, rushing toward the image, coming down and striking the image upon its feet. And then the whole image, as it were, disintegrating before the king's very eyes till nothing was left of it. And then the stone in its turn swelling and growing and becoming a great mountain and eventually, in the dream, filling the whole earth. Of course, such a dream, Nebuchadnezzar felt, must have a meaning. Of course, the ancient world believed that all dreams, or at least all impressive dreams, had some kind of meaning. And I guess there is truth in that. Even to our day, we're told by those who study the psycho psychology of the human mind, that our dreams do have some kind of meaning, usually. They, they can have some meaning regarding our conscious thoughts that maybe we can't consciously face. But in this case, it seems it was a dream that God sent because it was a dream that had prophetic significance. In fact, remember Daniel said that this is something that God has made known to the king that shall be in the latter days or the days that are yet to come. By the way, latter days in the Bible is sometimes taken to mean simply that which will occur at the very end of this age. But this is one of the many examples in Scripture that show that latter days doesn't always mean just that. It can mean days that are yet to come, days that are subsequent to the days in which we now find ourselves. In fact, we're going to find that this image, in fact, started in its meaning even during that very moment while Nebuchadnezzar was king. For we wish to go on and read Daniel's inspired interpretation, beginning in verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell <clears throat> the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of all the known world of his day approximately, at least wherever he chose to send his armies, he was victorious. And in light of what Daniel tells him here, we could believe that if he had chosen to send them even further, he would have had even a larger kingdom. For God had given the power of this world, the rulership of this world, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was indeed a great conqueror. He ruled a vast territory, a vast domain. Thou art this head of gold. And so the latter days take their start from that very day when King Nebuchadnezzar sits upon the throne of Babylon and indeed upon the throne of the world as far as imperial power was concerned. But let's notice verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. 
and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Here we have a succession of governments. First of all, Babylon, which ruled approximately 70 years. Nebuchadnezzar died during that period. He was succeeded by others. And finally, the final ruler, which lived at the very end of the Babylonian kingdom, was a man called Belshazzar, who is also mentioned in the book of Daniel, and under whom Daniel also served, and he was the one, remember, who saw the handwriting on the wall. And Daniel interpreted to him that the handwriting on the wall meant that his kingdom was taken from him that very night and was to be given to the Medes and the Persians. You will recall that the other night we talked about the prophecy, last night it was, that God made through Isaiah to the effect that God would give the kingdom to Cyrus. We talked about that as an example of the prophetic power seen that God has that is revealed in his word. One of the many examples of the truth of prophecy. That prophecy was fulfilled during the time of Belshazzar, about 536 or so. There's a little variation of dates here, 538 perhaps. Uh, historical scholars differ a little bit, but it's very close. When the Medes and Persians took away the power from the Babylonians, opened the two-leave gates of Babylon while they slept, the Medes and Persians marched in and conquered the city. And we read in the, later in Daniel, that very night Belshazzar was put to death. And the empire passed to the Medes and the Persians. They are therefore represented here, as we see, by this, the next kingdom inferior, which was pictured in the dream by the breast and arms of silver, the second part of the image, as it goes down the image. Then we go on where he says that there shall be another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. This brings us down to the one that conquered the Medes and Persians in its time. And of course, those of you who have studied world history and ancient history know that it was Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, the Grecian ruler, who, as <clears throat> ancient history tells us, led the brazen-coated Greeks. That was the way they were described in the ancient records, the brazen-coated gr Greeks. And that's how he's described here. The bronze, belly and thighs, the brass, the same metal in the original language here. And the King James translated brass. But that picture that is often given of the Greek armies, which were in, <clears throat> could not be defeated by the Medes and Persians, were invincible, and which destroyed the Persian power. The seventh chapter of Daniel also goes into these matters in another, ma another fashion, describing the empires as beasts succeeding one another. Also, the eighth chapter of Daniel speaks about the Median Persian Empire and its being defeated by the Greeks, the Macedonians, in turn. This being around 330 BC. So the Persian Empire lasted longer than the Babylonian, but in some ways was not as strong. At least the ruler did not have the absolute power that the kings of Babylon had. And we could talk about that, but we don't have time to go into those details tonight. Medo-Persia fell in 331, actually, in the Battle of Arbela near Nineveh at the hands of Alexander the Great. <clears throat> Alexander made Greece a world power. In fact, Alexander's empire was vaster in extent than any of the preceding ones. We are told that it covered Egypt and in northern Africa all the way to India. 
And when Alexander's armies got to India, we are told that he sat down and wept because he had reached the limits of the known world and there were no more worlds to conquer, some of the historians recount. Alexander made Greek thought and culture that of the whole world. Even to this day, the nations of the world and the cultures of the world look back to Greece, their sculpture, their architecture, their philosophy, and even their language as being one of the basic foundations of modern Western civilization. Many of the very words in our English language are Greek in origin. Philosophy, psychology, many, many other words that we could give you that are Greek in origin. The Greek language dominated the world of the day. In fact, when Paul later wrote his letter to the Romans, to the Christians in Rome, did he write it in Latin? Not at all. He wrote it in Greek. I think that's very significant when we think about that. However, unfortunately for, for uh, Alexander's family, they did not inherit his great empire. Later on, four of his generals divided the empire among themselves. And that is pictured very vividly in Daniel 8, where it is pictured as a division among four. And that is exactly what happened. But by the time that was happening, a new star was arising in the West. Remember that Daniel had told the king that a fourth kingdom would arise, strong as iron, that would destroy all the others. And certainly such a kingdom arose, which put down Greece, which conquered that part of the world that had been belonged to Greece, went down into Egypt, took Egypt, took North Africa, took Europe, which had never been held by the Macedonians, that is, northern Europe. In fact, conquered England and ruled in England for many years. And of course, I'm talking about <clears throat> the empire which is described in the Gospel of Luke, which was holding sway over all the world when Jesus, our Savior, was born. Luke, the second chapter. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now we're down to the year which we call one the one in our calendar, but actually a probably 4 or 5 8 B.C., as the, the chronologists tell us, the year when Jesus was about to be born. But notice that the decree goes out not from Macedonia, not from Medo-Persia, not from Babylon, but from Rome, for that's where Caesar Augustus was. That's where his capital was, that all the world should be taxed. This introduces us to the fourth world empire which ruled when Jesus was born. We read that this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Cyrenius's name has been discovered by the archaeologists. They used to tell us that this accuracy of Luke was very questionable because they couldn't uh, synchronize Cyrenius's date with this date. But later on, they discovered some more tablets that they'd missed, found out that Cyrenius was indeed the governor at the time Jesus was born. It corroborated what Luke had written. Modern New Testament scholars are very respectful toward Luke as a historian. They've discovered that over and over again, Luke's facts are accurate, both in his gospel and in the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. Luke was a very good historian. But let's go back to Daniel's description of this fourth empire. <clears throat> he had said that the fourth empire was going to be strong as iron, verse 40. It would destroy and break in pieces these other rulerships, these other authorities, which indeed it did. But then he said something happened in that fourth empire. 
doesn't say a fifth one is at hand, but he says rather that in verse 41, whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom, what kingdom? The kingdom he'd just been talking about. The fourth kingdom shall be divided, and but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom, which one? The fourth one is the one he's discussing. The kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken or brittle, as the margin says. And whereas thou, <clears throat> thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave or uh, hold together one with another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now it's obvious on any honest and logical reading of this passage that we're talking about one kingdom, Rome. The facts of history support it. The facts of the New Testament description in Luke 2, 1 supports it. We are talking about Rome. But we're talking about Rome in two conditions. We're talking about Rome first as a unity, as indeed it was when our Lord walked the earth. Rome was ruled by Caesar from the city of Rome. Wherever Caesar sent his command, that's what had to be done within his domains. The famous historian Gibbon, in his classic work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that as long as the Caesars ruled, Rome was like a dreary prison from which there was no escape. There was no place to go. The Caesar's rule went for many thousands of miles in every direction. And to make sure that Caesar's will was enforced, the Romans built great highways, some of which are still in existence and still in use to this very day to enable their armies and their messengers and their laws to go throughout the world of the day. And yet even that had to change and did because as we noticed here that the feet which also contained iron, the iron which represents Rome, show that there was a division because miry clay was mixed with the iron. What happened? What happened to Rome? Can we look today and see Rome in the same situation as it was in the days of the Caesars? No, obviously not. And yet, we are told that Rome continues on. It continued on and will continue on until the stone is taken out of the mountain, smites the image on the feet, and it takes the place of that image representing worldly governments down to the end, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then we read that in the days of these kings, verse 44, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. That kingdom has not yet been set up, has it? Not here. It hasn't replaced the kingdoms of this world. They're still very much with us. But let's look at Rome a minute. What happened? In 476, the Caesars were finally deposed. The barbarian invaders from the north, the Germanic tribes came down. And they took over. The Caesars were gone. Within a short few years, there was still a rulership from Rome, in Rome. This rulership claimed to be the successors of the Caesars. It was able even to, allow, to cause the rulers of Europe, which arose, the kingdoms of Europe, to say, we will accept that rulership. In fact, that rulership, which was now in Rome, saying that it was the successors of the Caesars, 
or the successor of the Caesars, even took the title that the Caesars had used, Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Pontiff. That was the title of the Caesars for centuries. And the new rulership that rose in Rome, which exercised iron rule as far as it could over the invading nations, which now came to be called Christian Europe, acknowledged that rulership in Rome as they had before to the Caesars, but now to the new Caesar, Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Pontiff. Those of you who know your European medieval history know that the Pontiff ruled in Europe. He could depose kings and did. He would t cut off whole nations if they didn't do his will. He would set up an interdict in which masses could not be said. The dead could not be buried in holy ground. They would not even do some of the other services for the people as long as the rulers would not do what the ruler in Rome said. In other words, I submit to you, friends and brethren, that we have exactly what Daniel described. We have Rome, but Rome in a new condition. The strength of the iron still there, but now having to deal with the miry clay and the brittleness of different nations through whom the iron had to work many times behind the scenes. The question is, is that still in effect? Is the pontiff still in Rome? Does he still claim to have power in heaven and earth? He most certainly does. He most certainly claims and tries to cause that claim to be accepted and is having increasing success, by the way, once more, going throughout the world and being regarded right now, according to all polls, as indeed the most prestigious and respected single figure on this earth today, believe it or not. And that is his claim, and that is what he says he can do, and he is increasingly being able to do it once more. We don't have to look for a future Rome. We've got a Rome right here today that's been here all the time for 2,000 years. First of all, as in the legs of the united classical Roman Empire under the Caesars, but today the divided Europe that still has the power and strength of Rome ruling and trying to influence wherever it can. This is the situation that we have and will have until that stone is cut out of the mountain without hands. When the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Remember, each of the four was left to other people who in turn destroyed the preceding one and who took over that kingdom. It's not going to be that way but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it, that kingdom that God establishes, will stand forever. I'd like you to notice in the seventh chapter of Daniel the description that he gives there, following the same information, basically, with some other information added. In verse 27, after he speaks about these different four beasts or four kingdoms that arise. I believe they're the same ones. Then he speaks of the one that the Lord will set up. In verse 22, he says, until the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints, the holy ones, possessed the kingdom. Notice verse 27. And the kingdom, that is the one that the saints will possess, the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom 
and all dominions shall serve and obey him. God is going to establish on this earth a kingdom. Notice that it is under the whole heaven. It's not in heaven. It's not above heaven. It is under the whole heaven. That means that, my friends, it is on the earth. And it will be throughout the earth. Remember that the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That is God's kingdom. And that's where it's going to be, on this earth. Praise God for that. Also, remember that the kingdom was not set up during the united condition of Rome. There are many people that tell us that Jesus set up the kingdom on the day of Pentecost. I'm sure some of you have talked to people who believe that, that the church is the kingdom, the kingdom was set up on Pentecost, and we're in the kingdom of God ever since. All you have to do is show them Daniel 2. The kingdom is not established until after the divided condition, which by no stretch of the imagination was true in Jesus' day, nor the apostles' day, nor even began until 476 when the Caesars were deposed and replaced. And so we see that the word of God squares beautifully with history, that it has been marvelously fulfilled in history. The question is then for us today, what are we looking for now? Well, I hope as we looked at these things tonight that we saw that that kingdom that is yet to come is God's kingdom. Not some future empire that's going to cover all this earth ruled by some world ruler that some would call the Antichrist. I don't find that in my Bible. I do find that there will be a division of mankind that will be ruled by different ones. We talked a little bit about that yesterday in our morning discussion. A threefold division of this world when the Lord comes. I find that very definitely. But right up until the end, this one who claims to be the successor, the iron power amidst the clay, rules. He's still there in Rome today. He's still ruling. And he's getting more power than he's had since 1870. I think we should watch these matters. We should be concerned about them. For our Lord is coming soon. I'd like to close with 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. I know I've taken a little more time tonight, but I think that the subject requires just a little bit more time. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> After Peter describes the things that we need to add to our faith, the things of virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness and charity. Then he says in verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we were in the kingdom of God now, as some would tell us, why do we need to add all of these things to our faith and diligently uh, work to make our calling and election sure so that an entrance may be given to us in the everlasting kingdom if that kingdom is already here? It's a good question that we should ask our friends who would try to tell us that. Are you giving diligence are you adding these things? Are you adding to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? These are the things that we must consider. Not forgetting that we were purged from our old sins if we, were, if we did accept the Lord's message and receive him by baptism and faith and repentance. We need to consider these facts because this prophecy of Daniel 2, which I consider the ABCs of prophecy, the basic prophecy we must understand before we can understand all these others that are more difficult, shows us 
that we are indeed living in the days when that stone may indeed come and smite the image on the feet, shatter human governments as they are now constituted, and replace them with the kingdom that will be of our Lord and of his Christ, as described in Revelation 11. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Praise God for such a promised kingdom as has been revealed to us in God's word. My prayer is that each and every one of us may prepare ourselves with all diligence, as Peter says, for an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.